an honor to present in, in lieu of a PowerPoint, I provided you with the map of Beleriand behind me, so that should give you some visual interest. Let's begin by imagining Christopher Tolkien's task in the wake of his father's death. He describes the extant documents, quote, crammed in disorder in that formidable array of battered box files, a quote, fearsome textual jigsaw with no clear order or chronology, while original drafts in pencil were wholly erased and written over, often illegibly, as we all know, in ink. In his preface to the Silmarillion, Christopher explains that he aimed for a, quote, coherent and internally self-consistent narrative. With this goal, as he admits, Christopher at times went beyond the role of editor-compiler to adapter-author when faced with competing versions of narratives and or incomplete narratives in a sequence needed for the cohesion he sought. For example, Jason Fisher points out that Christopher's task involved, quote, collecting, organizing, collating, editing, and even embellishing his father's scattered writings. He goes on, quote, the Silmarillion might well have been full of poetry, as many of the underlying tales and legends were composed in verse. Fisher thus reminds us that readers and scholars' first window into the elder days reflects Christopher Tolkien's decision to prioritize this coherent and internally self-consistent narrative, adapting and even inventing where the manuscripts left him no choice. His emphasis on cohesion had roots in his father's wishes, who, after the completion of The Lord of the Rings, wrote of the elder days, quote, the legends have to be worked over and made consistent, and they have to be integrated with the Lord of the Rings, and they have to be given some progressive shape. No simple device like a journey or a quest is available. I am doubtful myself about the undertaking. Perhaps no other testament to Christopher's achievement is greater than the fact that, despite his father's death, the disorganization of his unpublished materials, and the task of connecting them or not to the published thir Third Age works, he was able to succeed in giving us multiple portals into these legends in his father's stead. Of course, the Silmarillion as published is now only one text of many giving us access to the elder days, thanks to the decades long toil of Christopher Tolkien. Much of unfinished tales, as well as much of volumes one through five and 10 through 12 of the history of Middle Earth offer an immense wealth of detail about the first age, including varying genres or modes, competing versions, authorial and editorial commentary, maps, linguistic detail, names, indices, genealogies, etc. These volumes, as Christopher Tolkien explains in his preface to the peoples of Middle-earth, grew from his personal investigation into his father's process. Quote, an exhaustive investigation and analysis of all the materials concerned with what came to be called the Elder Days. While there is substantial editorial commentary as to the date of composition and revision, the condition of manuscripts, changes in narrative, etc., the controlling sentiment of cohesion or unity that so formed the published Silmarillion does not organize the history of Middle-earth texts. As a result, while these texts may ask more of readers, they provide a clearer sense of the way J.R.R. Tolkien worked through what Christopher calls, quote, the vision of his vision of the Elder Days. Through these volumes, Christopher has revealed the, quote, massive and continuous history of the First Age and has consciously avoided attempts to reconcile competing strands of narrative. Finally, the children of Huron, Baron and Luthien, and the fall of Gondolin offer up what Christopher named the great tales of the Elder Days. In these volumes, Christopher hoped, quote, to follow one single particular narrative from its earliest form and throughout its later development. These volumes reveal the way that Tolkien returned to these great narratives again and again through his lifetime, intertwining them with the major thematics of the First Age, particularly the heroic, tragic, elegiac struggles of the exiled Noldor and the Edain in Beleriand. For readers, even those familiar only with The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, it is easy to recognize the centrality of these great tales through the consistent allusions to them. With these three major forms of text recounting the Elder Days, in his role as editor, executor, adapter, son, and might I say even fan, Christopher Tolkien spent four decades or more fulfilling what he saw as his father's dearest desire, offering up the history and interconnected tales of the First Age. 
Together, the Silmarillion, the volumes of the history of Middle Earth, Unfinished Tales, and the Three Great Tales all attest to the existence or reality of Arda and its ancient past. They render the First Age a solidity in myriad ways through their various versions, frames, and interconnections. The ancient text thus boasts particular geographies, socio-political interactions, artifacts, languages and dialects, art and architecture, song and tale, borders and boundaries, journeys and maps that now undergird any notion of Middle Earth. As Christopher Tolkien explains, the first stage materials as we now have them function on at least two levels. Quote, in the history of Middle Earth, the development was seldom by outright rejection. Far more often, it was by subtle transformation in stages so that the growth of legends can seem like the growth of legends among people, a product of many minds and generations. Despite the challenge of making sense of his father's remaining manuscripts on the first stage, Christopher has managed consistently to provide us with a sense of these two levels, the itinerary of his father's writing and rewriting process, as well as the, as the sense of a tradition for the inhabitants of Arda, of tales, histories, and other ancient texts save from the wreck of Valerian. He explains further, quote, my father as author or inventor cannot always be distinguished from the recorder of ancient traditions handed down in diverse forms among different peoples through long ages. On one level, Tolkien, author and sub-creator, develops, expands, and revises the first stage materials from around 1916 until his death. On another level, scholars and sages of Beleriand tell, retell, expand, recite, and record legends from the Ainu Lindale through the great tales of Beleriand, and central locales such as Gondolin become a repository for those tales, which then filter down through the ages in various forms. One of the crucial results of Christopher Tolkien's life's work then is his success in rendering these two conceptions of Arda, revealed particularly through the first stage materials. To go further and provide a helpful way to consider these two resonance for the tales of the elder days, I would like to borrow two terms from film theory, diegetic and non-diegetic. In film, diegesis or the diegetic refers to any element within the world of the film. Diegetic sound, for example, refers to sounds, whether music or other ambient noise, that characters within the film can hear a car radio, noise from an open window, the explosions of Gandalf's fireworks at Bilbo's birthday party, for example, are all diegetic, all part of the world of the film. On the other hand, non-diegetic refers to anything not part of the world of the film, that characters of the film cannot see or hear, but that audiences can. The score, the credits, an internal monologue, narration over the action, for example. Considering the text from the reader's perspective, the way they sense the past legend and history in Tolkien's world, which render that world more real for the reader, emphasizes the non-diegetic, the effects on those outside the world of Arda. Likewise, examining the first stage materials with attention to the source material or composition, revision, and dating of Tolkien's work emphasizes their non-diegetic properties, how they function in or were crafted in the primary world. From a non-diegetic perspective for readers in the primary world, having these materials available results in an even greater sense of what critics such as Tom Shippey and Michael Drought have called the depth in Tolkien's work. The sense it gives us of layered history and the weight of reality behind the world of Middle Earth. These references hearken to what J.R.R. Tolkien calls, quote, the body of more or less connected legend in his subcreation. In his preface to the Children of Huron, Christopher explicitly claims that, quote, this book is thus primarily addressed to such readers as may perhaps recall the Lord of the Rings references to Ungoliant, Beren, and Turin, and wish to know more about them. This dedication foregrounds the non-diegetic in that Christopher seeks to have these third world illusions, third age, excuse me, illusions clarified for readers, for those of us in the primary world. Examining the first age materials diegetically, on the other hand, means to consider them as texts, manuscripts, and compendious narratives within the realm of Arda itself. 
as remnants of the lost libraries of Gondolin, tales brought from Valinor over the grinding ice, and salvaged and preserved in Imladris. From this vantage, these surviving narratives, references, partial tales, even objects like Sting, quote, a blade made in Gondolin, of which so many songs have sung, clearly have vital significance for those in Middle-earth. Within these tales of the Elder Days themselves, the conscious sense of a frame or tale-telling heightens the diegetic qualities of the text, or suggests how those tales have proliferated and impacted the inhabitants of Arda. Consider, for example, the following passage. Among the tales of sorrow and of ruin that come down to us from the darkness of those days, there are yet some in which amid weeping there is joy, and under the shadow of death, light that endures. And of these histories most fair still in the ears of the elves is the tale of Beren and Luthien. Of their lives was made the lay of Lethian, released from bondage, which is the longest save one of the songs concerning the world of old. But here the tale is told in fewer words and without song. This opening paragraph of the chapter of Beren and Luthien in the published Silmarillion offers numerous diegetic layers. The narrative voice positions itself distanced in time from the events of the tale, suggesting its survival and importance through the ages in Middle-earth. Among the tales of sorrow suggests there are many surviving tales of the elder days into later times. The reference to Lay of Lethian points to varying versions and genres of the same tale and implies translation. Fair Still in the Ears of the Elves reveals that the free people hearken to the first age tales consistently and value the lives and actions of their ancestors. And the self-conscious, here the tale is told in fewer words and without song, suggests that later inhabitants of Arda continually retail these vital stories in various forms, and even that the narrator is familiar with or has on hand other manuscripts containing those versions, many, many layers. The above passage attests the availability of the first stage materials reveals their crucial significance for the inhabitants of Arda and the ways in which the variety of texts, poems, discursive essays, partial narratives, competing versions, framing devices, etc., point to a tradition through which these inhabitants understand their ancient past. They have become cornerstones of cultural and personal identity for those within Arda, bringing into high relief the themes through which those inhabitants construct meaning. Exile, death and immortality, aesthetic creation, cultural cooperation. For characters in later times, such as Bilbo and Frodo, but even for Elrond, Aragorn, and Faramir, these tales and texts contain their history, genealogy, mythos, philosophy, art, legal decision, etc., and thus provide a sense of identity and connection to past places, events, and people forever lost. In one of the most famous passages in the Lord of the Rings, Sam and Frodo reflect on the ways their quest aligns with the ancient quest of Beren and Luthien. And in the telling or retelling in brief, they find connection, hope, and the ability to continue their task. Beyond what this moment means for readers, for Frodo and Sam, the citation of the Elder Days functions as a reference to a past reality a history that they both learned and now employ to their own recovery. To think of the first age materials diegetically then privileges their existence for those dwelling in Arda, asks us to consider them as historical, literary, archival material for those inhabitants. Because the War of Wrath that closes the first age results in catastrophe and cataclysm, the disappearance of Beleriand, the very lands and locales where the great tales take place, the preservation of those tales in their various forms becomes the primary way of retaining the memories of the peoples and lands so vital to the remaining peoples of Middle-earth. As John Marino notes, quote, comparison of the past and present asks for an effective response to what no longer is. For those who survived and for those who come after, the tales of the elder days functions at, function as the elegiac repository of what no longer is. Their various effective responses underline the ways that these moments hallow a past and create meaning in a present. While my work with the Elder Days has tended to examine the text diegetically, 
The wonderful thing about what Christopher Tolkien has given us is that the first age materials function continually on both levels, diegetic and non-diegetic. They resonate both as records of J.R.R. Tolkien's sub-creation, made and remade over the decades of the 20th century, and as a cache of ancient tales of the elder days that preserve and hallow the great tales of the drowned lands of Beleriand. In fact, in their discussion and commentary, both J.R.R. Tolkien and his son were able to move with great facility back and forth, discussing how Tolkien created and revised the world known as Arda, non-diegetic discussions, and discussing tales, events, peoples, maps of Arda as if they in fact existed diegetically. Maureen Mann notes that according to Arne Zetterstein, Tolkien, quote, could dwell in both worlds at the same time or enjoy an interplay between them. These tracks between the two worlds ran very closely together and Tolkien could rush along them simultaneously. Indeed, both father and son lived the construction of the world, its sub-creation, and within the sphere of Arda, discussing it, amending it, writing letters about it, and then editing, publishing these works. And both were able to write of the non-diegetic and diegetic interplay with ease. And I'll offer a few examples. First example, quote, it is to be remembered that the Silmarillion from the 1926 sketch onward was written as an abridgment, giving the substance of much longer works, whether existing in fact or not, in smaller compass. In this passage from the introduction to the Book of Lost Tales, Christopher references his father's composition process. It appears largely non-diegetic, focused on Tolkien as sub-creator. Second example, quote, the tale of the children of Huron is integral to the history of the elves and men in the elder days. Here, Christopher references diegetically the tale of Turin, focusing on the signific significance of that tale in whatever form for the inhabitants of Arda. Third example, quote, the tale of the fall of Gondolin gathers as it proceeds many glancing references to other stories, other places, and other times in the past that govern actions and presumptions in the present time of the tale. Again, Christopher speaks of the great tale of Gondolin in the diegetic sense, and points to the ways it is interlaced with other accounts, both past and present, in the time of the First Age. He reveals a sense of the tale existing and interacting with other stories of Beleriand. Fourth example, quote, the old legends, old now not only in their derivation from the remote First Age, but also in terms of my father's life, became the vehicle and depository of his profoundest reflections. This passage is a perfect example of Christopher's ability to dwell in both worlds at the same time. He reflects on the dual sense of the tale's ancient qualities. They are old diegetically from the elder days and non-diegetically. They are the earliest his father conceived. Final quote from J.R.R. Tolkien. They arose in my mind as given things and as they came separately, so too the links grew. Always I had the sense of recording what was already there somewhere, not of inventing. Tolkien here both acknowledges his role in making a non-diegetic position and suggests that elements of the world of Arda exist, placing himself within that world in the diegesis. Ideally, as readers, scholars, and fans of Tolkien, we have the chance to expand our abilities to see the Elder Days both non-diegetically and diegetically. With father and son as our guides, we can work to attain this fluidity between the diegetic world of Arda, whose inhabitants still celebrate the brave deeds of Baron and Luthien, and the non-diegetic world of the sub-creator and editor, who have made the created world real for us. Thanks to Christopher's first stage publications, we can at least make the attempt to inhabit both worlds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kemi. Um, really, really um, expanding on what we were talking about with the uh, panel as well. So really enlightening. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions. So as per usual, if you would like to ask Kami a verbal question, then please raise, uh, raise your hand and we will um, allow you to talk, as the button says. Um, if you would, uh, if, if, um, if however you you would like to just write down your uh, question, then please use the, quest the Q and A 
box, not the chat box, because that just get, gets lost in a flurry of comments. So, um, Bikami, I've got um, a first question by Ashlyn. Um, I dream of a visual adaption of the Silmarillion, the Quentin Silmarillion specific, uh, that would on diegetic things into diegetic. Do you think such a project would be possible? Also, thanks for a great presentation. Oh, thank you, Ashlyn. I, I dream the same dream I think many of us do. I, I think it's possible. The way I would envision it would be an episodic adapt adaptation. I don't think a two and a half hour movie or even a trilogy of films would do justice to the Quinta. Um, but I think it's possible to do a, an episodic series the way we hope. I think that Amazon is planning um, for what materials we're not quite certain. Um, so yes, I think it is possible. And then we can at least see um, the production designer's vision of the vision and, and make the non-diegetic diegetic and, and vice versa. So absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Super. And now, um, okay, so we've got a verbal question from Pablo. So Pablo, I'm just going to um, open it up. So if you unmute, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Um, I, was, I was wondering, and I'd like to know your opinion on this, particularly your opinion, how much we are these days uh, praising Christopher's work as part of uh, perhaps a process of self-reflection on the absence of, uh, you know, such gratitude and, and, and appreciation in the in the 80s and 90s, uh, particularly. I remember people in the talking fan base second-guessing Christopher's ulterior motivation for publishing the history of Middle Earth uh, volumes, and I, I'd love to know your own personal view on this. Uh, but only, of course, it's it's not an issue. Thank you. Um, yes, I think as I mentioned in the panel, I think it's also interesting to celebrate his process and his choices, given the fact that he too was quite reflective on that process as he continued through editing um, as many volumes as possible. Um, so certainly he also found fault with himself and was, was open to that criticism insofar as he responded to them in various um, introductions and prefaces. Um, I, I think that this is a, it really is a time for reflection um, particularly thinking about how much both Christopher and J.R.R. Tolkien valued the process of elegy, that is celebrating what has passed, valuing what has passed. And so I think it's wonderful that um, upon the sad news of, the, of his death, we've been able to take a space and to reflect on what would have appeared to me as completely insurmountable task of, of creating some sense of what his father had created. It's a great Thank question. You. Thank you. Okay. Um, and next we've got a question from Krista. So Krista's asking, uh, do you think there's a deliberate contrast between Frodo and Sam's interest in older tales with the general Hobbit obsession with letter writing, uh, which emphasized the passing on of contemporary news? Wow, wonderful question. Um, I, I think certainly you could you could consider the Frodo Sam distinction from a from a class perspective. Certainly, we see um, Frodo labeled numerous times by important figures as elf friend, and then we see him working on what we eventually know as the text. But then there's that beautiful passing of the text from Frodo to Sam, where Sam then gets the chance to at least write his own story. And so I like to think that part of that process for him is interweaving the references that we know exist back to the first age. Um, we know also he um, recited, did, did he not, correct me if I'm wrong, um, a small poem about Gilgalad. So we know he has some education or has at least been eavesdropping into Frodo's education. Um, so I think that they both have a knowledge of it. And that's one of the really fascinating things to me, being sort of predisposed to thinking diegetically is that it opens up the notion that they have been educated in what we know as the first age tales. So even the gardener's son knows about Gondolin, knows about Gilgalad, and I find that just endlessly fascinating um, that they're able to integrate their past into really a horrifying present. Okay. 
thank you. Um, one question that um, I kind of had as well, um, the, um, the talk of letters is quite interesting because obviously you've got letters within, so you've got the diegetic form of letters uh, that mm -hmm. form uh, to help convey information. Yes. Um, but also Tolkien was a massive tease um, in his own letters to his fans. So after The Lord of the Rings was published, he would say, oh yes, well, I have written um, the entire legends um, and that is forthcoming. So I, I was wondering if you could perhaps comment on maybe why he used the letter format um, non-diegetically um, for, for, and for what reasons maybe? To, to communicate with um, fans in the primary world, is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, like what, what was, um, is there perhaps more that he was trying to achieve just uh, rather than mm -hmm. simply teasing them? Think about this idea of, you know, we've got the feigned history, but mm -hmm. is it real history? It. Yeah, I, I think, I, I wonder, um, and I almost went down this garden path while writing the, the sort of, the issue, the tension between the fact that we know Tolkien had trouble finishing. Um, he, he loved process. Clearly he loved fluidity. He loved returning to old tales and revamping them, reimagining them. Finishing on the other hand, didn't happen a lot. And so I wonder if being a list maker, when I make a list, I tend to do those things with, for the joy of crossing those things off the list. And I wonder if writing letters and saying that he was in the process of writing the full legends helped him imagine the process of actually achieving that. Um, so it's sort of a psychological boost to himself um, to get those things done. Yeah, so almost like they're, they're motivators in yes. a way. But yes, it's almost ironic that he spends all this time um, writing these really extensive yes. letters. And also it's interesting that he, when he responds to um, fans in his own tengwa um, mm -hmm. as well, and he's correcting um, them, and he talks, you know, he's talking to them about Gothic in the Gothic language. It's just, um, but he's spending all this time on it, yeah. Perhaps if he had focused a little bit more, we, you know, he might have got a step yeah. closer. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. As, as a fan of Chaucer, however, I, I, I sort of lean towards celebrating the fact that it, it's open, right? The legends mm -hmm. are open and they're oh, available to us in, in all of these many perspectives. And so I, I try to um, think of it that way so as to not get frustrated. Do you think maybe then that the, the fragmented and incompleteness of it um, accentuates and really puts this idea of this is not a completed past? Um, at the forefront of it. Yes, I, I think so. And I think if you think of what we have um, surviving from our classical past, um, we have, you know, Homer's texts, but we know there were many, many incarnations of those texts as well as oral performances that we'll never know. And so in that way, the fact that they're fragmentary actually feels real because that's how things tend to survive, at least pre-digitally um, into, you know, into future generations. Yeah, yeah, no, so, so, so. Um, okay, so I cannot, there are no more hands, no more questions. Um, okay, so, uh, Kami, I'd like to thank you very much um, for answering those questions. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Someone's just pinged a, pinged a question, whoops. Um, Okay, so this comes from Sharon. Uh, your presentation got me thinking of the Silmarillion, which doesn't get the destruction of the ring quite right, mm -hmm. um, yeah. i.e. Sam and Gollum. Presumably because it's an elven slash diegetic history, not, uh, um, not one presented by omniscient non-diegetic narrator, are there other places um, you can think of where the diegetic presentation shapes the text? Interesting question. Be beautiful question. Um, I actually uh, spend a lot of time when I'm teaching uh, Tolkien on that passage from Of the Rings of Power in the Third Age, where it, it celebrates um, Frodo's destruction of the ring after 
my students and I have just read Lord of the Rings, and that's not, um, that's not the narrative that we have just read. And that leads to some really interesting discussions of history and what is history. Um, and they sort of have their eyes opened about what truths they have taken in the primary world as, as fact. Um, I'm trying to think, the thing that jumped into my mind as you were reading the question is the description of um, Thingol in particular, both, both when he is resisting the marriage between Baron and Luthien and then right before his fall when he puts on the Nauglamir and the dwarves are there, there's a sense that the narrator elegizes Thingol um, in a way that perhaps we as readers um, would not necessarily see him as a great majestic um, father of elves because he's acting right, quite fallen um, and mercenary in the time. And so there you can sort of see diegetically um, perhaps a, 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 a later historian commenting back and sort of re reframing Thingol for us. So that came to mind as a moment where that happens. Okay. Yeah, super. Thank you very much. Uh, just answering that last question there as well.